this is the uh, notebook that i prepared for uh, for this webinar uh, if you want to have a look at that you can go to my github um, the just search akshay bhal 21 on my github and you'll see this page and one of the repositories that i recently created is this one this is the webinar repository and you can directly click on this link to follow along on the notebook and um, if if i mean after the webinar if you want to take notes uh, you are more than welcome to do so and also this is more of a discussion so any questions at any time are more than welcome so uh, let's get started so the uh, the um, the main thing about what we been discussing is how do we exp exploit computer vision techniques to minimize uh, one of the things that i uh, you know when i was working in uh, machine learning and i was developing different models what i realized is that not all the people not everyone has the resources so what i used to do is maybe i used i could go to cloud but that you know costed some money as well as uh, you are not i mean the technology is new so you're unsure of how to exactly do that so i totally so I had some ba basic idea about computer vision. So I went back, I did some research on how exactly can I use computer vision techniques so that um, you know I can remove some some of the noise from the from the images or the videos, and then I can get a more uh, uh, you know a better picture of what about I was developing. Okay, so before I start, uh, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the Open Data Science Conference Boston team for giving me this opportunity. I reached out to them with an idea that you know I would want to present this work, and I feel that uh, you know I got uh, really interested, and a lot of help was given to me um, by the ODAC team. So I just want to say thanks to them, especially Elena, Vimal, and Rafael, who have been uh, really constant, I mean, constantly supporting me when while I was developing this. Okay, so a bit about myself. My name is Akshay Bahadur. I work as a software engineer with Symantec, and I'm also a, an ML researcher. So if you want to contact, these are the three links that I have. This is my portfolio, uh, which is my website. You can go through that, check out all the work that I have done, and all the latest work that I'll be doing. Second is my LinkedIn page. Uh, if you want to get connected to me and um, you know have a question, we could do that. And then this is my, again, as I already shown you. So if you want to contribute and you know think of something together, then you can uh, you know reach out to me uh, and see my GitHub uh, repository as well. Okay, so the agenda for today is well, we have the introduction. That is, you know, what exactly uh, we'll be looking forward to in this in this discussion. Then I would want to share a, a story that really inspired me, and I have you know at all the conferences that I go to. I think this story is something that I would like to share and uh, want people to see because this really inspired me to, uh, you know, do some meaningful work in this field. And then we will see a bit about some of the projects. So MNIST is the is the very basic project that you know if anybody. I I think almost everybody have, must have uh, who started out in machine learning must have worked on this data set. So this is basically you are given digits between zero to nine and although it's pretty simple but then you can always improve so uh, i'll be telling some techniques that i used while developing uh, mnis classification and then i had this autopilot application which is uh, an interpretation of a research paper by nvidia so this talks about the behavioral cloning part that is given uh, image of the road we'll be detecting the uh, steering okay and the last one is malaria detection this is something that i have been working on um and you know we'll see how exactly it goes so i have not made this malaria detection part public as of now uh, because i'm still working on it but i got some good results and i just wanted to share that with you okay so before we start uh, uh, this fun so we um so basically Sana helped uh Google Dev a Moss code keyboard and they have integrated that in the Google keyboard. 
Hi, I am Tanya. This is my voice. I use Morse code by putting dots and dashes with switches mounted near my head. As a very young child, I used a communication word board. I used a head stick to point to the words. It was very attractive to say the least. Once Morse code was incorporated into, it was a feeling of pure liberation and freedom. I think that is why I like skydiving so much. It is the same kind of feeling. Through skydiving, I met Ken, the love of my life and partner in crime. It's always been very, very difficult just to find Morse code devices, to try Morse code. This is why I had to create my own. With the help from Ken, I have a voice and more independence in my daily life. But most people don't have Ken. It is our hope that we can collaborate with the Gboard team to help people who want to tap into the freedom of using Morse code. Gboard is the Google keyboard. Um, what we have discovered working on Gboard is that there are entire pockets of population in the world, and when I say pockets, it's like tens of millions of people who have never had access to a keyboard that works in their own language. With Tanya, we've built support in Gboard for Morse code. So it's an input modality that allows you to type in Morse code and get text out with predictions, suggestions. I think it's a beautiful example of where machine learning can really assist someone in a way that a normal keyboard without artificial intelligence wouldn't be able to. I am very excited to continue on this journey. Many, many people will benefit from this and that thrills me to no end. Uh, so this was Tanya's story, and I looked at it, I think, a couple of, I know, it has been a long time, and at that moment, I realized that, you know, this is why I wanted to get into this field, that is to help people, okay, and since then, I've been trying small, small things uh, to, uh, you know, contribute into this field, so I would encourage everybody to, uh, you know, whatever small work, if they do that, then please share that on, on the open source so that if somebody else is developing something, he or she can look at it and get, get some inspiration. Okay, so moving on. I'll be talking first about MNIS digit recognition. So I'll first share the output that I got when I was working with um, uh, this digit recognition. Okay, so as, as you can see, uh, the main motive of, uh, of this app is to uh, look at uh, the digit that is being displayed right and then predict that accordingly so if you can see um, i'm getting uh, i'm taking image from webcam and i'm doing some pre-processing on that and after that it's it's displaying some output so if in in case of uh, this screen i'm printing seven number on the screen as in from the webcam and i'm able to recognize seven from uh, the webcam using some pre-processing and I'm printing that on the screen as well. So this is pretty basic. Let's see how exactly can you optimize that. Okay, so this is quite simple. I mean, there's no need to optimize it because it's already pretty optimized, but still, if you want to save some resources, then let's see how do you do that. Okay, so these are the basic import functions that we have written. We are importing Keras, NumPy, and Matplotlib. Okay. And then we are in this in this line, we are loading the training set and the test set. Okay, and now this is the function that I've written. It basically uh, gets the uh, in input image and the uh, the label for that and just prints it. So let's see if uh, so if you print certain x and y, we get the label is five, and you can see that it is also five. Right? Same is the case with with this. This is uh, number one. Okay, and let's look at the shapes. The shape is a 28 by 28, that is 786 pixels in total. And let's print one of the uh, input images, right? So the images are in the form of uh, pixel values. So the, the range lies between zero to 
255 I feel yeah 250 to 255 uh, so as you can see that there is a lot of uh, range in values that is the minimum is zero and the maximum could be 255 so if you look at it mathematically there's a lot of difference so um, in this case it's difficult for the for the model to converge right so for that we use a simple technique called as normalization so normalization is um, is used for scaling data so that um, you know you set a specific range in which you want to get the uh, input input images okay so the the basic uh, technique that i use is i divide it by the maximum value so 255 is the maximum value i divide the entire um, input images um, you know the entire vector into uh, by 255 so now i'll get the value between 0 to 1 because 255 is the maximum number i could achieve in pixels so if i divide by 255 the the range should be between 0 to 1 okay and that's exactly what i get so the shape remains the same right so x x train norm is i've normalized the data and if i print the shape the shape will remain the same it's 28 by 28 right and then i'm going to print the first example and earlier if you can see that the numbers were all um, scattered between 0 to 255 right now you get a very clean image uh, with values range, ranging between zero and i think this is the maximum one you know one so this actually helps because the mean of the entire distribution is 0 0.5 so it becomes better when you're converging it right it becomes it becomes easier for the model to train on this otherwise you'll get a lot of uh, you know spikes in your in your training uh, you know the training time that it's required it it might take a lot of time or it might not converge at all so this is one of the basic techniques that uh, you know that you guys could use okay so yeah and then the other technique that i use is that um, so in in the in the previous technique what we are doing is we are dividing by the maximum number so if you look at it the values will lie between 0 to 1 right and the mean is 0 0.5 but mathematically it's seen that if the mean is 0 then at that point the model will perform even better so what you could do is you can divide it by the mean right the the mean will be 127.5 for 0 and 255 and then you subtract it by minus 1 right so what this does is that the range will lie between minus one to plus one now and our mean is zero so if you can if you see that all the values that were previously zero that is the minimum value now minimum value is minus one okay now the minimum value is minus one and if you look closely you'll get some number which is plus one like this right so we have a minimum minus one we have the maximum plus one so the mean is zero and in this case you'll get a nice uh, if you plot the contours of your of how you are training, you get a nice circular shape of how exactly your mod if the model is trained, and in this case the model will converge even quickly. So, if earlier you were requiring let's say two or three epochs uh, to train the model and get an accuracy about ninety percent, you will only require one, or maybe you know maybe be between even while it's going one iteration, uh, you'll still get pretty good accuracy and the main part is that we need to make sure that our shape is correct so our shape is 28 by 28 which, which remains constant so in this case um, we have maintained the shape which is the most important part second we have normalized the images so that there's some minimum and some maximum value and the mean is also uh, zero okay so i've stored it in a different uh, variable x chain norm and the mean is zero okay similarly for test examples as well okay so this is the second function that i have written it pre-processes the labels so earlier labels were one or two or three now i want labels to be in a vector format i want them uh, you know in a categorical format so this is a simple uh, fun uh, you know library that we use is a function from keras itself it converts it into uh, you know a vector of uh, I think 10 because you can have 0 to 9 numbers, that is 10 classes. So it converts them into a categorical value. And I'm pre processing, I mean, I'm calling this function for the uh, labels of the training set and the test set as well. 
and this is basically reshaping my training and test data uh, into so the basically i'm just mentioning that you know the number of channels is one because the images are in black and white it's, there's no color image so i'm just mentioning that because kera requires this um, you know this output i mean this input as well that is the number of channels similarly i'm doing it for all the three variables so remember this is one extreme white x train and x test uh, where the range is 0 to 255 in x train norm the range is between 0 to 1 and in x train train norm mean 0 we have a range from minus 1 to plus 1 okay so i'm just printing a couple of values so that you know you'll have some intuition of what exactly is happening so the number of training examples is 60,000, then 10,000 text, text, uh, test examples. Then I'm printing out the shape. So these are the number of examples, the number of rows and columns, and the number of channels. And the Y train shape is number of examples. And 10 is because we are now considering a categorical vector. OK. <clears throat> so now I'm building up, you know, uh, a small uh, model so let's look at that it's pretty simple so i'm saying that you know this is a sequential model first i'll flatten everything you know the image x into y i'll flatten it and i'll uh, add a fully connected layer with an act activation of relu and then i'm dropping out 0.6 uh, you know i mean i'm dropping out 60 percent of the input nodes so that so what exactly I'm dropout does is that it adds regularization so that every node in the in the model learns something. Because let's say if all the nodes are learning, then what happens is that some nodes are activated at a higher rate. So your model will only learn from those nodes, but you want them to learn from other other nodes as well. So this dropout it blocks other nodes and only activates 60% of the nodes at a time in one layer. And then Similarly, I'm adding another dropout of 0.6. And then at the end of it, I'm categorically classifying them between 0 to 10. OK. And then I'm compiling my model. And I'm trying to save it as well. And so yeah, I'm just going to return that. And I'm going to print the summary. So this is pretty important because this helps you see what are the parameters that are trainable, the non-trainable parameters as well. So let's have a look at that. So as if you see, the first layer is 784 uh you know it has 784 nodes which means that 28 by 28 is equal to 784 so i'm just flattening them and then in the next layer i am putting 512 uh nodes and similarly again i have 128 layer uh, nodes in the uh, in the next layer and then in the final layer i have 10 nodes which each points to a number between zero to ten, zero to nine. Okay, and then you can see the the parameters, total trainable parameters, okay, and non-trainable parameters as well. And then I'm trying to call the model dot fit. So this is basically where the training happens. Okay, and if you see, I'm passing along X train and Y train. That is, the range is between zero to two fifty five. And if you look at it, the accuracy after one iteration is around 22 percent okay which is okay and it's not bad for the first iteration but i would want something more okay so now let's look at what will happen if the norm if the if the training set uh you know the range li lies between zero to one okay and in the first step if you can see this is the first iteration if you see the epochs number of epochs are one bad size is 64 other uh, you know other parameters are the same the accuracy is 66 percent so using the same number of resources this i mean same epochs everything is same you have just normalized it normalized the data the accuracy is 66 percent now okay and if you look at the third model the where the mean is zero the range is between minus one to plus one you will see that the accuracy is 73 percent right so if you look at uh, from this value from the from range between 0 to 255 the accuracy has improved from 22 percent to 66 percent which is quite high and from 22 percent to 73 percent 
uh, when you are training on uh, where the range is between minus one to plus one. So normalization is pretty easy, but at the same time, you can see that it is very effective. Okay, so if you, uh, one suggestion is that if whenever you are working with images or not even with images, if you feel that you can normalize the data, uh, I think this is a very good technique that, you know, I, I think everybody should do that whenever they're training a model. So the let's come to the next uh, next example. This is called as the autopilot, and so this is basically behavior spawning part, which means that given the image of the road, I want to predict the steering angle. Okay, so I did it in two ways. First is the Udacity self-driving car model, which is based on virtual data, as in they have their own simulation, and in the simulation the uh, parameters are quite fixed as in the roads will look quite similar because it's a computer generated model right and it's pretty pretty easy to train on right the data set is also not pretty uh, it's not very huge it's around 300 mb or something uh but the second one is was a bit challenging for me because this is based on a research paper by nvidia okay you can look at the research paper here as well as if you want to look at the blog it's here i've opened it we'll go through this as well a bit of it at least okay and then this is a description of exactly how this happened if you want to work on it the data sets for the v1 and v2 v1 is elasticity second is nvidia if you want you can get the data set from these you know these places and then i've given some references references from where i have uh, you know looked at some of the implementations so let's see how exactly uh, my model worked. Okay, so I use a lot of techniques uh, to optimize it, to make sure that I can train it on my CPU and not GPU. So if you see, it, it's a bit shaky when the predictions come into picture, but other than that, on the road it performs quite well, right? So on open roads, if there are no predictions then it performs really well. So this is something that uh, I think it's mostly related to, um, it's mostly related to the number of resources that I had, right? But I think this was a good uh, model to start with. And this is on, uh, on my GitHub as well. If you want to contribute, if you want to improve the model, you can do that, right? So as, as you can see, it, it, perform, it's, it performs equally well, I feel that, uh, you know, at least in open uh, roads, it's performing well. So I'm pretty much okay with it. Okay. So, oh yeah, so let's uh, look at this. Uh, so this is some of the imports that I have done. Then data, data. I'm loading the data, right? Let's, so let's look at, uh, you know, the how the images are. Okay. So, yeah. So this is basically show data function, which uh, lets you see the data. And if you look at it, these this is the important part, the number of rows, columns, and the color channels. So the images have a height of 256, a uh, width of 455, and three channels. So this is a pretty heavy image. Not very heavy because it is not HD, but still if you want to work uh, with it and if you want to build a model, uh on cpu it becomes extremely difficult because it takes a lot of time to uh for, for a cpu to train uh you know train this model but if you're working on a gpu then you can very easily do this right so this is how the data set looks like um you can see that this is the image don't look at the label i'm just using the same function so the label value does not make any sense right but in the original data set the label is the steering angle Okay, I'll I'll show you that as well. That's also in this notebook. Okay, so let's look at another uh, data. I mean, another image. This is how the looks like. Okay. So what I've done is that uh, instead of using all the channels, okay, and uh, the entire image, I've resized. So by resizing, I mean I have reduce the number of uh, you know the height and the width of the of the image okay and in, in that what happens is that the number of pixels get reduced so that you have less pixels to work with and also one of the things that i did is that i added a preprocessor 
so that uh, I don't want to use all the three channels, right? All the three channels are not very necessary for me. I mean, it might be if I want to build a better model, but if I want to get something, you know, to just get me started and just to get some intuition from, I probably use maybe black and white image or some other image format because as you can see that the road is pretty dark as concern as you know as compared to other parts of the image so if you just look at the road the road is a bit darker than the other parts of the image so i've built a model according to that so if you look at this process function what i'm doing is i'm resizing my image right i'm resizing my image into 100 by 100 so earlier the image was 256 into 453 i have resized that into 100 by 100 okay and then this is the important part that i'm doing i'm saying that you know convert the image so it is basically uh, mostly black and white but you get saturation value of of different color ranges so if you want to uh, if you want to read more you can google that up but it's simply if you want to ask me it's simply uh, you know different dark regions are portrait darker uh, and clear images or clear regions are a, a bit bright <clears throat> so this is how the image looks like so the original image is this okay this is the original image and this is the converted image okay so as you can see uh, the road has a pretty distinct feature that is the side of the roads are black pretty dark in color center is a bit dark and these are the other regions so this is the trees the bushes right so it becomes pretty distinctive and, and for this image this image if you see this is how the converted image looks like so you can see a pretty distinct road and the trees i mean for human eyes it's a bit difficult but for the computer you can easily recognize some pattern that you know whenever i find something like this this is basically a road and based on the road i have steering angles okay so this is simply i'm importing all the all the uh, libraries that i'm using like keras and sklearn okay so this this piece of code it just gets collects the data right it collects the image from from the folder and the steering angle as well and it does the pre-processing so the pre-processing is uh, you know this is the function that we have written to convert image into hsv uh, and resize that as well right and i'm storing it in pickle in a pickle file okay so this is for storage i'm dumping it into pickle files okay and in the next piece of code i have load I, I mean i have loaded the data from the from the pickle files okay uh, and this is where i'm loading the data and then i'm shuffling it so that you know you get different uh, you know different images of uh, of different roads and not just a series, series of images from the same road that helps in better training and then i'm splitting the data uh in, in a ratio of 70 to 30. so 70 percent is my training set 30 percent is my test set then i'm again reshaping the data it's pretty simple and then let's print and look at how the uh, images look like so the number of training examples is 31,000. Uh, testing on 13,000, and this is how the shape looks like okay so let's look at the data now okay so this is the image that is stored. This is from the uh, training example, and this is the sitting angle. Okay, so minus one is something around left, and plus point something will be going towards right. Okay, yeah. So now let's look at the original paper. Okay, so the original paper talks about how the model should look like. So it's saying that you know I have three channels, and I have this uh, this height and the width. Right, I'm normalizing it. I mean we have just uh, learned normalization. And then we are adding some CNN layers, 
and then we have another fully connected layers and then the final value okay so this looks like a pretty uh, heavy model as in for the cpu to train on it becomes difficult it takes a lot of time uh, so why not look at something a bit simple okay so one of the things that we already did is to pre-process the image we have made sure that we have removed the three channels we have only taken one channel okay and we have reduced the size from 66 into 200 200 into 100 okay which is uh, comparatively smaller so let's look at the original model so this is the original model if you look at it this is how the paper model looks like okay so it starts with 66 uh, 200 by 3 and then we are building a con layer uh, adding con layers we are adding dropouts okay and then the most important part is the summary part okay so this is how the summary looks like and at the end you can see that there are 132,000 trainable parameters so this means that whenever you are doing back propagation you have to train all these mod uh, all these uh, you know parameters and this becomes difficult for the computer to do because uh, it requires a lot of computing uh, power okay so let's look at the model that i developed because we have pre-processed the image we know how the uh, you know how the image looks like so this this part this is the same as the normalization part we are normalizing the data okay and then we are adding a con layer with 16 filters and we are taking a stride of five by five then we are adding activation we are doing a max pooling layer and similarly again we are doing the same thing this time we are increasing the number of filters and then i'm flattening it i'm adding dropout and these are the fully connected layers and i'm storing it as well okay so let's look at the model now so if you can look if you look at the end the number of total trainable parameters are just 80000 now okay so this means that from 140000 we have reduced the trainable parameters to 80000 and this model also uh, performs exceedingly well i mean you have just looked at at the example and if i try to fit that i'm trying to fit that uh, according to our model it obviously takes time because it's uh, mine is a cpu but if you see the loss is already down to 0.3 or something so this is the first epoch i've closed it in between and uh, the loss is around 0.3 and if i train it for another four to five epochs the loss will be way less so at the end of it uh, when everything is done you will get something like this you'll get a model which performs quite okay and uh, you know this is something that you could start to work on so why waste all that resource when you can use some computer vision techniques to make sure that you have uh, you know you have a good with less number of resources okay so yeah so this was uh, about autopilot this is the model that I developed and um, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, even with less number of parameters, you can get a good model. Okay, so basically I stopped the this model dot fit function. That is why there's like a keyboard interrupt because I did not want to waste time. Okay, and this is the malaria detection. This is a new repository that I'm working on. Okay, but I just wanted to share some of the insights that I already have okay so i'm importing all these uh you know all these libraries let's see how the reader looks like so this is how the infected cell looks like so this is a cell and these are i think this is how you spot malaria if you get these pink dentures okay and one more if you look at this data it has some pink pinkish formation a purplish formation added and if you if you see that then that means that the image is parasite so it's uh, it contains malaria 
And let's now look at the normal cells. If you see there are no thing dentures, it's clean, uh, clean and simple cell. And similarly for this one as well. So, you know, all, although the color might be a bit different, uh, but you can see that there are no, uh, you know, no purple formations or anything like that. Okay, so now we're trying to add some filters. So this was, I was working on, uh, you know, adding different filters and if I could get something, we can also use other techniques uh, to get uh, more intuition. But I thought that, you know, why not just use some inbuilt function and see how exactly that works. So this is how HLS uh, conversion looks like. If you want to read more about HLS, uh, you can definitely do that. It's also basically uh, getting diff. I mean, if there's a change in color, it uh, recognizes that and it turns it into a yellowish pigmentation, as you can see. So it's able to recognize the the purple dendrites. Uh, you know, the, sorry, the purple dentures. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at the uninfected images that is the normal cells, because there might be some change in value, color value, it's also picking a lot of noise around this part. So if I want to train my model on this, on this data, uh, it becomes difficult, okay? Similarly, so now I have used HSV format, the same format that we use for autopilot. Now I try to do something similar for uh, you know, malaria as well. And, and I just thought that it might work. So it's working pretty okay with the uh, infected, uh, you know, the infected cells. You can see that the pigmentation around the, around the pink, uh, you know, formations or the purple formations, it's able to capture that. But at the same time, if you look, but at the same time, if you look at, Sorry, I just had to switch this. Okay, so yeah. But at the same time, if you look at this HSV format, right? This is the same image. This is uninfected. You can see that because there is some change in color, it's thinking that, you know, this is also, this part is a bit different from the rest of the cell. <clears throat> which is okay in, if, if you use HSV, but when we are training the model, this will add a lot of noise and our model will not be able to be accurate. Okay. So now I've used uh, LAB format. Okay, so this is also does a similar thing, but there are very minor differences. I would want you to read up more on this so that you get a good idea on exactly how this works. So this also sees change in color, but this sees uh, a change in color over a larger area. Okay, so if you can see, it's able to get where the color has changed, as in the you know the purple formation that you were getting around the infected part. Okay, and then if you look at the uninfected cell, it almost remains the same. So now if we use this uh, preprocessor, this is we are converting it from image to LAB format. If you use this, um, you know, at this preprocessor, we are going to get some good results because as per my knowledge, it's able to recognize uh, parasites and uninfected cells pretty easily, okay? So yeah, so I did not train a model on this. I mean, I already have, but I just wanted to share some intuition on how exactly this works. Okay, and some of the other works that I have done. Uh, so this was all for for this uh, you know webinar. I wanted to include it more, but we had some time constraints. I did not want to waste much time. But if you want to look more, right, you can find some of the other applications that I have developed. And uh, if you want to, uh, you know, go ahead and see other things that I have done, you can look at my GitHub profile and, you know, get back to me if you think that anything else can, can be contributed, okay? Okay, thank you for interesting lecture. 
and everybody just want to remind that uh, you will receive recordings in one week and all other webinars from ODSC you can find at learnie.com platform. Goodbye for today. All right. Thank you, guys.